Okay, welcome everybody. Um, let me stop sharing my screen so that you can see me. Um, welcome to the session on grounding policy. Um, and thank you very much for joining. We um, may still have a few more people joining as we go along. Um, my name's Fiona. I work with Care International and I'll be facilitating the session. Um, just to start with, um, to remind about the housekeeping rules, um, just as in other sessions, that please use the chat box. You'll find yourself muted, remain muted, um, and video off um, unless you get a chance to speak. Um, in the group work, uh, we will be doing group, group work. Um, we would love to invite you there to put your video on. Um, Please don't share the link with anybody else. Um, and do introduce yourself in the chat box. We'd love to know who you are and we, we won't be able to allow everyone to say hi. So I see that we've started that already, that's great. Um, and just to let you know that if we do reach a certain maximum number, we're going to lock the meeting so that we don't overcrowd our, our discussions when we get into the, into the group work. Um, so once again, welcome. Um, the session, as I mentioned, is grounding policy, how communities and local participatory processes are informing adaptation policy and planning in practice. And the session's um, going to be sharing experiences and practical lessons focusing on success factors and challenges for local voices being heard and influencing the outcomes and being part of decision making and adaptation planning and policy. And we want to really look into how do we overcome the very real challenges that we are all experiencing and facing. Um, sessions hosted by Care International. Um, it, there's a climate learning and resilience for advocacy program in care, which Obed Karingo is working in and Obed and I um, are hosting this session. And to say also that Obed hosts the, um, he coordinates the Southern Voices on Adaptation Community of Practice, where Southern civil society networks um, exchange experiences and learning on national to global civil society advocacy, especially around the NDCs, NAP, and more broadly adaptation planning and policy. Um, the Southern Voices Network has conducted quite a few studies um, to generate evidence around influencing, um, particularly this year around how adaptation is included in the NDC updates. Um, so in this session, a number of the civil society organizations who are members have joined the session and will be sharing um, their experiences with all of us. Um, the network also partners very closely with the NAP Global Network and we're very pleased to welcome Angie Dazzy as our co-host um, and she's leading learning around vertical integration in that processes and she'll be sharing a little bit with, of that with us shortly. What are we going to be doing in the session? Um, we're going to explore how um, these processes can better inform and influence adaptation policy and planning and discuss the challenges um, and how, how they can be overcome relating to four key themes. So the themes will be um, addressing those when we get into the group work. And we're hoping by the end of the session that we'll have collectively developed and even prioritized some key messages to inform adaptation policy and planning processes to be um, more inclusive um, and listening to local voices. Um, so, before we go into the, um, the rest of the agenda, we'll be having a framing presentation from Angie. We'll be having three examples from three different countries um, to get us going and thinking about what's actually happening on this, on this topic. And then we'll get into breakout group discussions and have time there to come up with some messages, which we will feed back and um, uh, assess, and then we'll wrap up. So before we jump into the session, we'd love to know who we are, um, especially in relation to this vertical integration. What, uh, where are we all coming from and where are we, what level are we working at? So we have a little poll for you. Um, and if we can launch the poll, um, please 
as quickly as you can um, answer the two questions which you can see here. Um, and then we will see um, when we're done, we'll, we'll be able to get a visual impression. Okay, we're almost there, just a few more to go. There we go. So we are nearly all of us from NGOs and majority from national, but a good balance. So that's great because we do want to look at how um, you know, the whole vertical um, process of planning all the way from community up to national above. So thank you very much. And without more ado, we can move on. And I'd like to invite Angie, ah, wait a minute. Um, Michael, could you share the result? Um, or I can. There we go. Sorry, I thought everybody was seeing this. Um, there you go. So this is the a visual impression of who we are. Um, thank you again to all of you for joining the session. Um, and I think we can stop sharing and then we can move on to the uh, the next part. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Angie, um, you're welcome. And if you could give us a short introduction to vertical integration so that we can all be on the same wavelength. Thanks very much, Fiona, and good morning from Ottawa, everyone. My name is Angie Daze, and I am an associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And IISD hosts the Secretariat of the National Adaptation Plan, or NAP Global Network. So I've been asked to provide a short introduction to our topic today. And in providing these remarks, I'm going to be drawing on insights from the NAP Global Network. So for those who aren't familiar with the network, we're a global initiative that aims to advance adaptation action in the Global South. We work with governments and other stakeholders to support effective national adaptation planning processes. To do this, we provide technical assistance, we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning processes, and we share knowledge on adaptation planning and action. Vertical integration is a key theme for the network, and we feel that local to national linkages are critical for effective NAP processes. So I'm going to assume that everyone attending this session agrees that it's essential that communities and local organizations, including women's groups, community-based organizations, and other grassroots actors, meaningfully participate in adaptation planning and policy making processes. We know that this is important from a rights-based perspective, for gender equality and social inclusion, and for effectiveness of these processes to ensure that no one is left behind. These principles are also established in the UNFCCC, which calls for adaptation to be participatory, transparent, and to consider vulnerable groups, communities, and ecosystems. It's also essential to create opportunities for community-based adaptation to be implemented at scale, moving away from fragmented initiatives to policies and systems that facilitate local action. This is something that I believe the CBA community agrees on. The question is how? How do we ensure that people at the grassroots, including those who are marginalized, have a voice in adaptation decision-making at all levels? How do we ensure that national policy processes like NAPs and NDCs are informed by local priorities and that they create an enabling environment for adaptation at the community level? How do we ensure strategic and intentional linkages between the different levels from local to national? These are the challenges we want to explore today. To get us started, I wanted to share one example of what this may look like, drawing on the NAP Global Network's guidance on vertical integration in NAP processes. The graphic on the slide shows how linkages can be created between the local level and the national level in an adaptation planning process. There are a few things I wanted to highlight here. First, the linkages must be two-way. Community level needs and priorities must be fed upwards to inform national planning, while national plans must provide a framework for subnational planning. This is an iterative process with improvement of linkages over time. 
Subnational governments, particularly those at the level closest to the community level, play an essential role in linking the grassroots to planning, budgeting, and other decision-making processes at higher levels, and they need the capacity and resources to do this effectively. Attention to gender and social inclusion is important at all levels, not just the grassroots. For example, having the ministry responsible for gender and social development involved in the national coordinating mechanism for adaptation can really make a difference in how the problems are framed and how solutions are defined. And finally, these linkages rely on information sharing across the different levels, effective institutional arrangements to ensure ongoing coordination, and capacity development to enable government actors to facilitate participatory processes and stakeholders to effectively engage in adaptation planning and policy making. Making this work is a huge challenge and one that requires creative solutions. The speakers coming up are going to share some examples of how this has worked in different contexts, as well as some lessons that they've learned along the way. Throughout the discussions to follow, I would really like to encourage you to focus on the how. We know that local voices are essential for effective adaptation planning and policy making. So how do we get there? What needs to happen? I will leave it there and I look forward to discussing this further. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thanks very much. Sorry about the slides. I don't know quite why they were jumping up and down. Um, thanks very much. Um, and from here, I would like to um, move on to introduce our, our three speakers who will elaborate um, in a few minutes um, some examples of how this is working um, at different levels and in, in different countries. Um, so my three speakers are um, Julius Ngoma, who's the national coordinator for Sisonek in Malawi. He's also a Southern Voices member. Um, and he'll be speaking um, around how women have been engaged in the Malawi adaptation planning process, the NAP process, and what they've experienced and learned from that. Welcome, Julius. Um, also to introduce um, Christopher. Uh, Christopher is the Initiatives Manager for Care International in Uganda um, and his case study is around how CARE supported the integration of community adaptation action plans that they developed with different community groups in, um, in an area of Uganda where there's quite a large refugee community and working with the refugees as well as the host community um, and how they worked with the district development planning process to get these community adaptation action plans um, incorporated at the district level. And our third speaker, um, welcome to Jessica. And Jessica is a specialist on gender and vulnerable populations in the Directorate for Climate Change and Desertification in Peru. Um, good morning, Jessica. Thank you for getting up early. Um, and Jessica's case study relates to facilitating engagement of indigenous um, and local civil society voices in the NAP process in, in Peru. Um, so welcome, welcome to the speakers. And I'd like to um, call upon Julius first. Um, and maybe we can have Jessica to go second and then Christopher. Um, so Julius, um, and let me stop sharing my screen now so that we can see you. Um, Julius, um, in the support you've been giving to women's engagement in this Malawi NAP process, what do you think was the most important factor to ensure that women's voices were heard and that they influenced the outcome? And what would you do differently if you could go back to make sure that they had an even more significant influence? Um. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much um, um, for Fiona for introducing me and welcome to all of you uh, to this session. Um, um, I'd like to begin by uh, indicating that um, indeed uh, we, uh, civil society and network of climate change in Malawi, have uh, been engaging and we thought uh, we felt uh, an opportunity was on our table when we, want, we actually 
saw that there was um, the government of Malawi introduced or launched the NAP process uh, uh, for us to actually um, um, uh, engage and also develop for the country. Um, just uh, for your information first, Malawi is an agro-based economy and uh, with that uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, farmers uh, in Malawi um, may, uh, for which are actually making up to 80% of the population. And uh, even when you, we look at the farmers uh, in Malawi, most of these are poor rural women farmers who are actually comp comprising of 90% of the population uh, that is uh, doing farming in Malawi. But we have also been heavily affected by the impacts of climate change. Uh, droughts, floods uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, um, which uh, tells us uh, simply that uh, the, the population which we are uh, talking about here, which has been uh, practicing farming for a, a lot of time, uh, for, for, for quite some time, is also affected, heavily affected by the impacts of climate change, which is the women group. Uh, so with that, uh, they are also particularly are not um, uh, able to adapt to the impacts of climate change on their own, uh, although they are facing a lot of challenges that uh, would uh, need to be assisted. For example, we've been, uh, um, the, the women have not been able to uh, participate uh, or be engaged in different uh, kind of processes that are leading uh, to the development of uh, policies and even legislative frameworks that can help them to, to, to adapt to the impacts of climate change. They are the least uh, uh, to have, you know, to access to the resources, uh, financial resources. They are the least uh, to have all the, the, the education uh, that is needed for them to adapt or even uh, for them to be informed uh, by, by different processes on how they can uh, manage uh, climate change. With this, um, we, we also, so this uh, process of uh, national adaptation planning as an opportunity for us to start addressing uh, or contributing to addressing the, the impacts of climate change, particularly those that are felt uh, by these uh, women farmers who are the most vulnerable uh, in the country. So uh, we, we tried uh, uh, to ensure that uh, at the beginning, we have to, to create a platform that is will help to actually consolidate whatever issues are there in terms of um, uh, uh, women involvement. Uh, so um, at the beginning, right at the beginning of the NAP, um, NAP national adaptation planning process in Malawi, we had to uh, contribute to the setting up of what we are calling the coalition of women farmers as a women group uh, that helps to actually uh, consolidate all the efforts that the women uh, on the grassroots at, at district level and even at national level are doing to actually feed into different uh, policy development processes. In this case, especially the national adaptation plan. We had to do that because we wanted to address the challenge where uh, uh, farmers, women farmers were not able to coordinate, were not able to actually be heard and also be uh, you know, represented in different uh, technical committees at different levels at grassroots uh, district and even at national level. We took advantage of this uh, uh, creation of the platform to start, you know, engaging and even training farmers, uh, women farmers, on some of the um, uh, elements that they were actually lacking. Uh, for example, we're training them on uh, how to analyze budgets and policies, and so that they are able to engage with the policy processes uh, in a very informed way. And we also actually assisted the women farmers to actually train them on how uh, on climate change related issues, climate smart agriculture issues, including other uh, issues that are related to, uh, to, to them engaging uh, in, in the uh, agriculture sector as a business. For example, farmer market schools, farmer business school approaches. We were also actually uh, helping these farmers to actually ensure that they are part and parcel of uh, put, uh, the participatory monitoring and evaluation processes of different um, uh, you know, uh, policies, particularly the national adaptation planning, because this is a, uh, you know, a process that was actually ongoing and we needed them to actually engage and influence the, the, the policy development process. Uh, with all that, uh, we, we had to carry on to actually make sure that these women are also given the, the platform of linking them to, with the decision makers 
as they uh, as they actually were trying to actually contribute to different uh, processes uh, with the inputs that we're actually generating from the platforms that we're actually uh, creating. So we could link them, uh, we assisted in linking them to, to National Technical Committee on Climate Change, for example, the National Adaptation Planning uh, uh, core team that was there, but plus also other, uh, you know, uh, decision-making uh, uh, platforms that were there at national district and even at, uh, at community level. And uh, just to stay, say further that um, uh, after this, we had three uh, key outputs that uh, we could, uh, this women uh, engagement uh, in structured way uh, contributed to. The development of the national adaptation planning uh, um, uh, stock taking report. Uh, they also contributed to the development of the Green Climate Fund um, uh, readiness NA proposal that was submitted by government of Malawi in 2019 but also they were in the, led in the process of actually developing the NAP um, uh, uh, roadmap. So all this, uh, if, we, uh, if I was to go back, then one thing that I would say was that to ensure that uh, when uh, to lobby uh, um, at first with the government that whenever they are trying to set up such kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, policy development processes, they have to also ground that um, into, you know, making sure that the different uh, stakeholders who are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are represented uh, fairly in different committees that are going to take up the process moving forward. Thank you so much. I'm available if we can discuss uh, uh, further if there are other questions. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julius. Um, and a reminder to everybody, please do put, use the chat box for your questions, uh, comments and so on. Um, we may not have a lot of time for um, the, the, the speakers to answer, but we'll ask them to also put their answers in the chat box. So please do use the chat box if you have questions. And um, yeah, thanks, Julius. So, um, interesting points around the need for developing representative institutions that can link in a more formal way with policy processes and that there was success in terms of what they're able to link up with but actually representation from the beginning is what we need to be lobbying for thank you julius um jessica um i'd like to um invite jessica um, to to join us now. So Jessica will be speaking from Peru. Sorry, um, and you are welcome, Jessica, to um, talk to us about indigenous voices, civil society voices in the NAP process in in Peru. You are welcome. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Uh, thanks for the the space and for make uh, to share each other uh, the good things uh, as we do in in that process so in peru in 2019 we carry out a prior consultation on the regulation uh, for the framework law on climate change within the framework of the right of indigenous peoples and then we considered that we had a Extensive experience uh, to carry out particip participatory process. As a result of prior consultation, the indigenous uh, climate platform is great. In this context, uh, uh, we do the NAP process in 2020. Uh, so the NAP process was carried out when we had a month in quarantine for COVID, a situation never experienced before. So we have to do the NAP process virtual with indigenous people. The, that was really, really, uh, really hard. Uh, I think we can highlight two, two success factors with indigenous. The first one, uh, the previous close relationship with indigenous people, which is based on the principle of flexibility. For example, it implies that ministry made a methodologic proposal, but it was improved with contributions of indigenous people. Dates and times 
were changed. And an ad hoc methodology was great for them. Uh, the second one, uh, we had a previous training for the use of Zoom platform. Uh, first, we planned to do group trainings of about 10 people, but under the principle of flexibility, we ended up doing training for two or three people. So you can imagine the work, which ensured that on the day of NAP event, they could connect and participate without problems. Um, in the case of civil society, a meeting was held only with them. And there was a space to collect uh, contributions and they will also another uh, space for uh, give contribution, contributions during, during the public consultation, which implies the, the prior publication of, of the NAMP on the web to collect contribution for all stakeholders. Uh, when, when you ask me uh, what will I do differently, um, I believe it's necessary not only to provide uh, data for connection to indigenous people, uh, but also to provide device for virtual participation. Mm. It's not the same con to connect by phone that by, by computer. And it's not the same to connect through a old telephone than through an iPhone. Uh, we have a gap, an uh, internet and digital gap, and we have to see that. Um, the second thing I have to, I, I think we have to, to improve is, is that we have to create a space only for women and young people. Uh, we did that during the regulation of the framework law, but unfortunately in the NAP process, we did not, we did, we did not repeat the action to the singular context. But it's necessary that these two groups, mainly young people, women, have a doc space and methodologies. A doc, it's only for them. And the third factor um, is that we have to do sessions in their mother tongue. Try to collect contributions from someone who speaks to you in a language that does not handle a hundred percent generates that you do not collect all contributions and that you do not ensure that the information provided has been fully understood. Uh, we have to, to work a lot in the future for translate uh, the, the, the information and we have to translate also the participation process. Thank you for the space. Thank you, thank you, Jessica. Yeah, these are real challenges that I, I'm sure in the group discussions that we will be, we'll be discussing. Um, and we need to go in more depth to really unpack and understand you know, how we can overcome these. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, finally, I'd like to invite Chris. Um, Chris, you're most welcome um, to speak to us um, about uh, Uganda. Um, and I know that last year, the, all the districts in Uganda, uh, it, was, it was the time for them to develop five-year district development plans. And my understanding is that this coincided with communities being supported by CARE to develop community adaptation action plans. So there was an opportunity that you had to find ways to integrate the community plans into these longer term five year district development plans. Um, so we'd love to know what you found was the most important factor in actually achieving this and getting the community plans and priorities to be included and what you might do differently if you could do it again. Welcome, Chris. Um, do you do you go ahead? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Fiona, uh, for the space. 
context and uh, uh, thanks very much for the Spandan context. So uh, like you, you rightly put it, uh, last year uh, in Uganda generally was a planning time and uh, most of the districts were developing uh, uh, district government plans that uh, would uh, go for a period of five years. And uh, this, as care, we saw it was an opportunity uh, through the different local partners for us to influence uh, the planning to ensure that the voices of the local community of the grassroots communities are well catered for in uh, in the plan. So one to kickstart this, we ensured that uh, we did uh, undertake an assessment to ensure that uh, we get to understand uh, how uh, the different uh, gender groups um, affected by the. Are vulnerable to the climate. Uh, we, we did this exercise in collaboration with the different uh, district uh, leaders, and, and in a way, it gave us an opportunity to engage uh, the leadership of, uh, of these districts from the start. But we didn't only look at the district level, we took it down up to the sub county levels where we did pick uh, the different uh, technical staff and the leaders to be part of the exercise. Now, that one gave us uh, a buy-in, but also the leaders were in the know of the process and, and were expecting some issues to integrate in the, in the district plans uh, or right away from the sub-county plans. So that was good that it gave us that opportunity. Now, some of the things that gives us confidence that uh, the issues that we presented to these districts and the sub-counties are clearly the voices of, of the communities, is we did reach out to the different categories of people in their different capacities. We well know aware that um, Uganda is host districts where we are mainly focused on uh, uh, refugee hosting districts, uh, like Arua and some of you who could be aware of. So, um, we did reach out to the uh, refugees uh, as refugees to hear out their voices and then also collect them. Uh, the same was done to the category of, of, uh, young, of the youth, uh, both young girls and boys. And then we did the same for women and men to hear out those different uh, views and their issues, uh, mainly even based on, uh, on climate change effects. Um, that gives us confidence that uh, this process, the voices, whatever the uh, was integrated in the district was the voices of the community. But how did we do this? We feel that giving uh, room, owning, helping the community to own the process. One, we made it clear that most of the civil society organizations facilitate these processes, and in a way, it looks like we are owning them. But this was from the start leveling the ground and informing the community uh, that care and the partners are only, but at the end of the day, these are plans that should be owned by the community. And the expectation is the community should push for them to be integrated in the district development plans. Now they can't do that on their own. What we did was to also go ahead and form them into groups at sub county levels where we are able to build their capacity on how do you lobby and advocate to have these issues well integrated. So the issue was that uh, we trained them in the skills of lobbying and advocacy, and then also helped the, to facilitate them to attain the several planning to ensure that what they are pushing are really the voices of, uh, of the people. So that was already um, an, an achievement to us. And given that these are issues they push and they are passionate about, we're really confident that uh, they are pushing issues uh, that really concern them. And uh, it is, it is there from their own uh, initiative from that. Then uh, also the, the fact that we managed to, to, to train this, forming the different groups of the refugees. For instance, uh, we know that uh, the refugees were well concerned that given these districts are, being, are hosting them, it is also the mandate of the district to plan for them uh, on some of the government programs. Uh, this was the, never the case uh, initially, but now we, we happen to know that uh, in this, we, we're not there where we want to be, but we are happy to know that some of these districts have deliberately now agreed to plan for the refugees to benefit on some of the government initiative now. 
This helps us uh, in terms of trying to ensure that the refugees are self-reliant and they do not necessarily have to depend on uh, handouts from uh, the different civil societies. Uh, so that was key to us. Then also uh, ensuring that um, these people that we, the, the leaders that we involved uh, helped us also to push because the leaders were, in the, were included in the process from the start where we, we started to do the assessment. We went back to do validation of, of what was in the report that we developed, again with the communities and again with the leaders. So uh, one, we got the buy-in of the, of the few leaders who were part of the exercise in that whenever these uh, community people would push for these issues, they would have a backup voice from the leadership because they were there. They were part of the process. They had the women's voices. They had the youth. They had the refugees. So when it would come to integrating them, they would clearly be in, in, in agreement and say, yes, this is what is needed uh, at the grassroots level and we need to, to do this. So for us, that was, uh, was the score and it gives us confidence that uh, it, is, it is indeed uh, the voices of the community coming in. Then also having the fact that uh, we, we are supporting the communities to realize their potential. In doing CAPS or in doing community action adaptation plans, the communities are able to realize that not all their problems should be solved by the, by the, by the leaders, should be solved by the district, the sub -count, but actually they have the potential to also solve some of the problems. So when you draw a plan, the communities are able to see, we can actually do this for ourselves. Uh, all we need is to come together. So some of the things were uh, climate smart agriculture. They realized that they can actually have, uh, they can actually do this on their own. And by doing that, they come in two groups and one group supports another group to adapt to their practice. So that was the other key that uh, was realized uh, and that made us also happy and confident that the voices that are being presented are from the community indeed. Now, if I'm to go back, what one thing that I would, uh, would do better, uh, one key thing that I would highlight would do better is, is reaching out to the smallest uh, structure on ground to hear those voices, to pick those voices. Now, of course, with the limitation of the resources, we did this at almost at, uh, at a parish level. But if we went back, the best would be to go as far as the smallest unit, which is a village, and pick the voices of these people from the village and then be able to consolidate. And then that would uh, surely give us confidence that what we are having included in the development plan is, is very much integrating the voices from the different people. So, but as now, what, the, what we did was more at parish and sub-county level. Well, that gives us confidence, but if doing better, then it would mean going to uh, the lowest unit, which would be a village, uh, which would even mean having the disabled alone, um, each, each and every category on their own, such that we pick those voices and consolidate them. Uh, thank you, Fiona. I'll be available to answer any questions. Um, from anyone, I uh, can see some questions flowing in the chat box. I will be answering some of them. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Thanks, Christopher. And I think one really important point you raised is that when it comes to empowering uh, local communities, there's two aspects. One is in terms of their own agency um, and having the adaptive capacity to make their own plans and actually act and implement by themselves on those plans. And at the same time where that's not feasible, having the agency to now engage with local government and find ways to lobby for, for support from that level. Um, and many other very interesting points. Thanks so much. Thanks to Christopher. Um, because we are really quite behind time, rather than allowing time for, um, for questions now, um, we'll go straight to the, to the groups um, and that's where you'll have the opportunity to, um, to discuss further. So all the three speakers will, will be in three different groups, obviously not more, um, and we will go ahead into um, six groups. Um, 
where we're going to talk about how can communities and local participatory processes better inform and influence adaptation policy and planning. And we're going to do this in relation to themes. Um, so one theme is gender and diversity, which relates very much to what Julius was talking to us about. Uh, one relates to subnational adaptation planning. Um, that's around what Chris was talking more about. And one around participation in NAP processes what Julius and also Jessica were talking about. And the last theme is looking at the linkages between all of them and how do we create effective linkages from the local to the national. So what we're going to do now is each group, each theme has a, um, a facilitator and you'll have 30 minutes in the groups. Um, in case your facilitator doesn't appear or doesn't start talking, take it, take, you know, get going anyway, put on your video, introduce yourself, um, maybe less than five minutes because we are a bit behind. Um, and then the facilitator is going to really bring one particular problem related to the theme, which you can then discuss in depth, drawing from your own experience, how can this challenge be overcome? What needs to change? Um, we have a Google Doc where the reporters are going to be noting um, noting down the challenges and the changes that need to happen um, and that's important because um, we're going to use the notes in the google doc together with very short verbal feedback with each group will only get less than two minutes uh, about one and a half minutes to give your top points from the group work so we'll be using the google doc and the records in there the notes there together with what you share verbally um, to generate a collective outcome. Um, and at the end of this session, we're going to do some voting relating to what we come out with as a collective product. Um, so let me just double check. Yeah. So I think, um, please continue using the chat box, adding your questions and comments there. If we do have any time right at the end, we might have a chance for um, some verbal Q&A. Uh, but right now I'd like to ask Michael that he can launch us into the groups and we'll have 30 minutes there. So it's now 10 to, so 20 past the hour, um, we'll be back. Actually quarter past the hour. Quarter past uh, the hour. One final note um, I'd like to make to all the uh, session hosts for these groups. Uh, you should all have been able to uh, or been made able to record um, what happens within your group. So if you could please start recording uh, once I send you into the groups, that would be very helpful. Okay, I will open them all now. Um, if not, my name is, uh, is Christian Letwell. I work at the International Institute for Sustainable Development uh, and I'm based in Ottawa. And I'll be co-facilitating co this with, uh, with Jessica, who you heard from, uh, from earlier. Uh, and so in terms of the um, in terms of the challenge that we wanted to discuss, so as you heard from my colleague Angie, um, we've been supporting national adaptation plan processes, and we heard a, an excellent example from uh, from Jessica on indigenous engagement in the NAP process in in Peru and some of the um, opportunities and challenges there. Um, so the challenge uh, that I wanted to discuss in this uh, group is that. Um, as we all know, an, an effective process engages uh, engaging as a variety of stakeholders uh, takes time, it takes uh, resources, both human and financial, and it requires capacity, uh, such as uh, an understanding of gender. And while governments want strong and good processes, they also want uh, processes to move forward quickly and to comply with uh, both national and international deadlines. And so the question I wanted to, to ask to, uh, to you in this group is um, how do we balance this need for participatory and inclusive processes with the urgency of meeting deadlines and moving processes forward in a timely way? And is that in general or is that specifically for the NAP process that you're asking this question? So um, we wanted to focus on on national level uh, adaptation and, and policy. And sorry, I, I may have <laughs> may have glossed that. So this this um, discussion will be on um, the the framing question is um, how communities and local participatory processes can better inform and influence national adaptation uh, planning and processes. So um, hopefully um, some in the group have been in, engaged in kind of formal national adaptation plan processes. 
Um, but uh, there, you know, there's kind of a lot of lot, lots that's happened at the national level on adaptation that isn't kind of necessarily for, formally part of a national adaptation plan process. So that's certainly relevant as well in terms of uh, local and um, uh, community engagement. I suppose one question I have <clears throat> on this is in many ways, you know, if you want full and proper um, engagement from the local level and from communities and from groups that tend to be hard to reach or the more vulnerable, the more marginalized, is the right question to ask how we can, how countries can meet deadlines set or imposed externally or internationally or actually you know, should it be done differently that, you know, should it be recognized that maybe for a country to have a much more thorough process and a much stronger engagement, then it shouldn't be about meeting such deadlines, but actually be about the process itself and making sure that it's right and correct. And for those setting the deadlines to actually show flexibility um, and, you know, and focus more on the process than on, on when it needs to be done by. Great, thanks for that. Um, any any reactions or any uh, any kind of feedback for that uh, that input? Yeah, I'm i agree. I'm agree because uh, always a community people and indigenous people told that you have a deadline, but I have my process. And we have to, to understand that we work for rights, not for products. And the rights are a process in, in, in a, a big, very big process, no? And so Jessica, just to kind of, um, to unpack that a bit, have you seen any kind of solutions in it when, you know, you see these really strict uh, deadlines in kind of negotiating for um, for more emphasis on the process rather than on the deadline. Yeah, we have to to change our deadlines. We have to put the deadline with the people, not with the international process. Uh, and because the indigenous people and the the young and women want to put the, their own deadlines. They have a lot to do, uh, a lot to, to things to do, not only climate change, they have to live. Uh, one of indigenous uh, say us, you make meetings, you make uh, uh, workshops, but I have to work for live. And this is important, Kate. Uh, so from others, uh, have you experienced uh, challenges related to kind of the need to balance a strong process uh, and a strong participatory process with the, the need for um, kind of urgency on the, the government side? Um, and what, uh, what kind of approaches and solutions have you used to, to overcome that? Hi, it's Vincent. I'd, I'd love to say we had some solutions. We don't. I mean, we're all driven. We're, we're all process driven. We're driven by NAP processes, we're driven by COP, we're driven by government um, sort of uh, policy, policy sort of frameworks and, and, and um, timeframes. Um, I mean, there's a real need to shift the balance of power here. Um, there's a lot that we're doing in the space, for example, of shifting the balance of power and knowledge and learning. And I think we're having separate sessions later today on knowledge and learning. And it's about moving knowledge and learning from a north south direction to a to a south south direction calling in the north as and when needed i think this is linked to it if you can shift that balance of power to the people who are most affected by in the most vulnerable countries being affected by climate change are able to start setting the timetable then i think then you can start to get those holding the power to start listening but i don't think we're anywhere near that at the moment i mean we're locked into processes like cop which are well, apart from COVID and apart from this year, are an annual process where we're in the short term horizons and we're saying we need to act faster rather than slower. We've got a real imperative to act and to move towards net zero and all the rest of it. And that's that's it. That's overcome. What's the word I'm looking for? It, um, 
it's kind of overpowering people's capacity to keep up with that. I think we're all kind of feeling the pressure from working in the sort of organization like I do in the, in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to local, local organizations in Peru or Africa. I think we're all sort of wrapped up in this, this rush to try and deliver results. So I'd really like to get, you know, to, to see how we can strengthen the voices of the South to contribute to not slowing down the process because the imperative to deliver on climate change is absolutely critical. But how we can make that work for the poor is not something I've got a solution to, but something I'd be very supportive of seeing a solution to. So it's the movement is in the right direction. Uh, thanks very much for those comments, Vincent. It's a really well well taken point. Um, I, I think um, just to, to look at the the chat from the the plenary, we had one uh, participant who had said um, there are only twenty national adaptation plans that have been communicated to to the um, UNFCCC to date, and this is something uh, at the NAP Global Network that we hear often. Um, people say, you know, most countries have a, an NDC. Why are there so few um, national adaptation plans? And does this show that the you know, that the processes aren't moving forward. Um, I, I think that um, my, my colleague Angie uh, responded and, you know, I think our short answer is that there's a lot of progress happening in countries. Um, and a lot of it is on these really important process oriented pieces, uh, you know, around strong institution building. But, um, but it's uh, often the challenge is that people don't, you know, if there's no national adaptation plan in place that people can easily see and understand maybe that the funding won't flow, but if there's not a strong pr process, then that funding won't reach the, the grassroots and vulnerable um, communities and ecosystems that need it. So it's a, a bit of a, um, it, it's it's not a, a simple uh, <laughs> a simple uh, challenge at all. Um, I, I would be, you know, I'd love to hear others' response on how do you kind of balance those two two pieces the need, uh, you know, to, to kind of communicate out to, to, to donors, maybe specifically, um, about all of these, you know, the progress that's happening uh, alongside the need to kind of um, really emphasize that shift from power to, from the north to the south. Uh, I just wanted to share my experience uh, because currently we are implementing a climate pilot project in Northern Shan State of Myanmar. In that project, uh, we are uh, 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 we are conducting the uh, CBC process, climate vulnerability and capacity assessment process with the uh, uh, with the community members. So, what I observe that the when we when uh, when we did did this process that look at people understand the uh, climate change risks and also climate trends and also what uh, climate impact uh, people uh, and also uh, their livelihoods. So that kinds of information, uh, they reflect themselves and they produce, they produce the, like, uh, you know, their experience and also how they are overcoming, uh, currently how they are overcoming this climate change risk. So uh, now we are, analyzing the results and then uh, we have uh, we will produce the air uh, as uh, evidence and then we plan to uh, advocate with the uh, uh, township development uh, administration department and also the uh, different uh, government departments at the township level at the same time uh, we are planning to uh, advocate at the uh, national level uh, through the uh, network uh, we have a um, uh, Myanmar Environmental MERN Man Network. Uh, they are influencing; that they can be influenced to the uh, national level because uh, when the government, Myanmar government, developed the uh, Myanmar climate change, uh, Myanmar climate change policy, so although they haven't developed the uh, NAP yet, but uh, they have developed the uh, Myanmar climate change policy and also master plan. So under this master plan, uh, they have uh, uh, some of their uh, priority areas include to, as you know, the, down, the adaptation plan are encouraged under this priority set us. So we were trying to link with the uh, grassroots uh, voice to the uh, national level. So we are using this kind of uh, process we are doing currently. Thank you so much for, for that, Nila, and um, and that's uh, 
you know that that's really helpful um and so the the evidence that you you're presenting um when will uh you know what kind of iterative process is there for the update of the climate change policy and master plan do you see kind of a, um a clear kind of are, are there very clear entry points and uh do you think that you'll be able to kind of um in, influence the nap process as well when it um when it begins if it hasn't already Uh, and and also uh, based on the uh, result of the uh, the assessment results, we will be using the results into the development of the uh, community-based adaptation plan. So this is also the uh, participatory process. And also we will invite uh, township level departments and also our administrators to involve in this process. We will try to engage them at the community level. So we can link, uh, we can link uh, the community adaptation plan into the uh, township development plan. So some of the barriers uh, community cannot address, uh, we, uh, we can uh, request the government to address them because, for example, the community can address some of the issues, but some are, uh, they will need some resources like a many or technical something like that. In that case, we can uh, collaborate and uh, co collaborate with the uh, government department to address address the issues of the uh, community priorities. Thanks so much. And it sounds like that kind of really important work of linking the community to the township plans is already happening. Um, can I ask if? You're seeing the the priorities that are reflected in the the communities uh, that you're working with. Um, have you heard kind of similar um, similar adaptation priorities from other communities in in the country? Um, do you think that there would be kind of a an opportunity to to kind of speak together as one um, to to um, to prioritize some adaptation actions in the national process? Uh... I haven't had any clear information from the uh, our coll colleagues, but uh, they are also trying to trying to uh, uh, trying to do the uh, na national level and also community level. Uh, on that point, Christian, just thinking in terms of you know the link between the kind of community priorities and national level priorities you know in in many ways i suppose a nap and community priorities are kind of two separate but complementary kind of elements in the sense that in i mean we've been working on the um, devolved climate finance mechanisms in several countries including in kenya and in kenya where it's called the county climate change fund mechanism the mechanism allows for communities to decide and prioritize on the kind of investment the resilience investments that they need um, and they develop their own proposals and you know within the process it gets you know it gets funded by the counties and i think within that work you know what matters is the coherence between the community priorities and then the local development plan, which in Kenya would be the county integrated development plans for counties. Um, so, you know, at the national level, your NAP would be much broader than a set of, you know, community priorities. I mean, you've got to set the scene in terms of where you're going. Now, that has to be fed through a bottom up process. Um, you know, you do need that information to come up. But, you know, where the, you know, what also matters actually is making sure that at the local government, there's that coherence between what communities want and then how how those areas are being developed. Um, you know, I, you know, I think they. I mean, you need to link them, right? You wouldn't want a nap that's done without community input or prioritization, but but you wouldn't want a, a selection of projects in a nap. You you know, it has to set out a vision. You know, I would have thought. I mean, I've not been involved in the nap process, but you you would want more kind of vision that's been fed upwards. Um, so there, I would see them as kind of different but complementary and kind of, you know, you know, needing to link. I think uh, I also need to learn from the uh, Uganda experience because now they are uh, linking with the grassroots level and the national level and national adaptation plan development. So I think uh, I can learn from the, uh, the Uganda experience. Can I come in? 
I, I'm glad Flo mentioned the Kenya, uh, the Kenya County Climate Change um, Fund. I mean, that's a really good example of, of sort of progress in at least linking to local level and getting local voices heard. I and mean, it's very much through local government, uh, but it is something that has now been replicated in, you know, it started in Wajia County in Kenya. It's now been replicated in other arid and semi-arid counties in Kenya. Um, you know, it, it's it's a good um, it's a good starting point. Let's say that, that other countries could could pick up on. I, I did want to mention as well because it's kind of tied into that as well. Is I mean, we've we've got the LDC group at UNFCCC. I mean, UK and Ireland are supporting. You probably heard about the Life AR initiative several times these last few days, um, and, and the UK and Ireland are supporting that. And that's that's a sort of aspiration of forty seven countries to actually change the ground rules on on both how climate finance is managed and how it reflects uh, sort of demand from local level. So they say they're going to do things differently. They say they're going to um, respond to um, local level demand. They're going to meet, um, sort of deliver 70% of climate finance to meet that local demand and change the game plan in those countries through, an, through sort of an incremental process, starting in seven countries, ultimately in 10 years, moving it up to the 47 countries of the whole LDC uh, group. Um, but again, it's a long-term process. They haven't got the methodologies worked out yet. They've got the commitment, they've got the LDC vision, which they launched last year. But I think processes like this week and, and the, the adaptation conference in January and things moving forward will help to start to bring the ideas together actually how they can make this work on the ground. So hearing examples from Myanmar, from Peru, from Uganda, etc., certainly helps to provide guidelines towards how this can work across, across a very sort of um, heterogeneous range of countries and very different political systems and sort of aspirations. Um, but at least we've got, uh, you know, we've got an organisation of 47 countries have come together and said, we want to do this, we want to make it work. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And, and I think that um, responding to Nilo's point as well, you know, as, as we all know, th these are iterative uh, processes and, and, you know, the uh, county climate funds are um, definitely a great example of, you know, trying to respond both be accountable downward to, to grassroots um, stakeholders, as well as uh, feeding those priorities, as you were saying, flow uh, back upward towards national level policymakers. And I know that there has been um, some link to, to date uh, in the NAP process um, in Kenya to, to uh, county uh, climate change funds. So I think, you know, hopefully we'll see those kind of, um, those links uh, strengthened e even more. Um, so in, in terms of kind of, um, in terms of the kind of the, the different examples that we've heard here, so uh, I just want to make sure that I can uh, kind of sum this up. Um, great, but it would be great to hear from from others. Um, what are some of your key takeaways so far in the discussion on um, on how to balance this need for inclusive processes and uh, overcoming the challenge of kind of um, you know uh, the interest of moving these processes forward urgently, often to to meet kind of externally posed imposed deadlines. Well, I, I think the Life AR initiative Vincent mentioned, you, you know, is about business unusual and about turning the tables. It's about letting the country set the pace. And this isn't about doing it slowly or or wanting to, you know, uh, not move forward. I mean, the, the LDCs he mentions, you are very much, you know, wanting to take the lead and want to move forward, but it's about them setting the pace in terms of what works for their country. And there'll be different paces for different countries. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I think it partly is turning the tables around and, and, and yeah, letting them guide the process in, instead of the other way around. But that has a lot of implications and that's as vincent had mentioned previously is not straightforward you know due to a lot of other pressures great thanks for that um and, and others uh empowering uh local peoples and also uh, empowering uh civil society organization and networks that will uh, for in our country it is uh more feasible to uh, advocate the government. So empower local communities and also uh, civil society organization and network is uh, important for us in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Jessica, were there any kind of takeaways that uh, you'd like to, to make sure we report back? Yeah. Mm. I'm thinking about in, in Peru, we have a lot of uh, interest on, in donors uh, to give us money to make um, energy projects. And it's the not same interest to uh, to give us money for participation process. And that is a problem. In prior, prior consultation, we have we have to to work a lot to ensure the the, the money. And the money it's it's very important. Uh, the participation is not possible without a team, without a communication, without, uh, uh, without translators, it's not possible. So we have to change the donors' minds too. Can I say, I think Jessica raised a very important point related to that in the plenary earlier. It was about digital exclusion. So it's about giving money for, uh, you know, sort of participation. But at the moment, with the world moving on to digital platforms and to virtual platforms, there's a real risk of exclusion because large, as she, she, Jessica mentioned, large proportions of the population still are not connect, connected. And participation these days means, to a large extent, digital participation, um, as evidenced this week, but, you know, as will continue to be um, apparent. So I think addressing that gap is really important part of the supporting the local voice and bringing the local voice into decision making. How do we ensure that that local voice is being adequately reflected in the type of platforms that we're sitting on this week and that are, are continually saying they represent um, developing countries uh, at sort of um, or local communities at develop uh, at, at sort of uh, national and global platform level. And I mean, um, you know, the UK is, is at the moment we're having discussions with people like the Global Resilience Partnership around this, and potentially how we can potentially support that, that sort of change in, in sort of digital, digital inclusion to, to broaden that out more effectively. Uh, thanks so much. For, oh, sorry, please. If I can, if you don't mind, yeah. And, and maybe Jessica and, and Nila can, can shed some light from their experience, but we often talk about participation and participation as being the way to include the most vulnerable, et cetera, but often they're the ones who cannot participate. They're the ones who do not have the time to be part of such events. So often participation, it reaches the local level, it reaches communities, but it often doesn't actually reach those we really do want to reach. Um, and, you know, and what, and if you cannot reach them because they don't have the time, because they're too busy, etc. Um, you know, they have to live their lives, as Jessica said, you know, um, and not be part of workshops. Well, you know, what other processes are in place? Is it about greater accountability, greater kind of feedback mechanisms? You know, are there other processes to make sure that those who do not get heard have a way of getting heard or have a way of input or have a way of making sure that what is done benefits them? And I don't know if maybe they have some experience about because you know we see participation as a solution, but actually often we don't reach the ones we say we want to reach. Yeah, so I think, um, Jessica, would you like to respond to that? I'd like to complete one thing, one thing because we are thinking about and uh, flow in, it's reminding that participation also implies a prior information time. Without complete information, participation is not possible. And uh, I always see we in design participation process without information. And people go to the workshops, but they work like they work, they go, they, they go like in, in blank space, no? And this is, we have to, to, to remember that too. We have only for, uh, Yes, it looks like we have 45 seconds, but uh, I think that that's a great point that uh, participation isn't the same as influence, um, just because you're there if, you, if the awareness raising hasn't been been done and, you know, that translation isn't happening, then absolutely. Um, it's not going to be, you know, actual influence on the process. Um, are there any last thoughts uh, for this session before we get bounced back to the plenary?
Um, if not, I'll just, I, will, I think, uh, Flo, your point on um, on the need to kind of, you know, how, how can we overcome this? I think Nilar's point on using associations might be one kind of uh, solution that we might have in trying to have a collective voice through, um, you know, through different. Uh, Fiona, sorry, I think you're on mute at the moment. Sorry, uh, sorry, I hadn't muted. Sorry, welcome back everybody um, from, the, from the group work. And we will jump straight into sharing back the key points. If I can just ask that the reporters of the groups make sure you are uh, capturing everything, have captured everything in the Google Doc. Um, but I'll start um, to invite Group one, Angie's group, um, if you could share in, in just one minute um, the highlights of what came out from the discussion in group one. Um, and if the reporters, if you could try to capture what your presenter says in the Google Doc, that will also be very helpful for the next step. Uh, so Angie, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about how to ensure that planning and policy making is responsive to gender and diversity. And I think two big things came out. One is the need to create platforms that link grassroots organizations together so that they can define collective priorities that can then be communicated by spokespeople for those collectives um, in government spaces um, through advocacy processes and through formal planning and participatory planning processes. And then the other big piece is that the governments who are guiding these processes, coordinating these processes, whether they're at subnational level or national level, need to create mechanisms and create negotiation spaces where these collectives of grassroots actors can um, bring their priorities forward. And we had some interesting examples from Bangladesh, from Niger, um, where, where this is happening. Um, I think there's an ongoing challenge in getting from the local level to the national level, but there's some interesting work being done that we can learn from. And I will leave it there. Great, thank you very much, Angie. Nice and um, concise, thank you. Um, Obed, let's move to your group. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fiona. In our group, uh, we were discussing on how communities and local participatory processes can better inform and influence subnational adaptation uh, policy and planning. And one of the main issues was to how to ensure this is effectively done by ensuring that communities uh, adequately feed into the subnational adaptation planning and uh, policy processes in an effective manner. And uh, a number of issues came up, uh, but one of the main issues that came up is uh, the issue of uh, capacity to, to engage. Uh, we find that, uh, for instance, in uh, an, an example from Kenya, where uh, the, there are structures that in, uh, involve communities uh, to participate in, in defining various pri uh, priorities in terms of adaptation needs at the subnational level, but they do not have the re relevant capacity even on, on what climate change is or what they need to uh, uh, feed into uh, these policy processes. So adequate uh, capacity uh, uh, to empower these communities is very, very necessary. And another uh, action was ensure that these consultations and, and, and community participation processes are done at the community level where the, the, those who are actually vulnerable uh, exist. Because one of the challenges that came up was that some of these consultations are done at the, at the, at, at the urban level where uh, the communities and those who actually need to engage are not able to reach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Abed. Um, I'd like to ask, um, I should have asked earlier, if everyone can listen up carefully to the points that are raised. Um, and if the point you wanted to share has already been said, pick a different point. Um, 
So let me ask now Christian if you'd like to share in just one minute some top priorities, highlights from the discussion. Welcome, Christian. Thanks, Fiona. Um, we were talking about how communities and local participatory processes can better inform and influence national adaptation planning. And um, we had a, an excellent discussion um, talking about the challenge of balancing strong participatory processes with uh, with deadlines and urgency to to kind of move these processes forward often coming from national and international processes so that uh, just very briefly the group um, um, kind of had a, a great discussion and there was a strong feeling that deadlines should be uh, set by countries themselves uh, rather than externally imposed as part of a broader shift um, to move from the agenda setting being in the, in the global north uh, to the global south and uh, there was also um, a point raised to overcome challenges in participation and to move from participation to influence there needs to be a strong awareness raising uh, so that the the vulnerable communities and uh, um, representatives from vulnerable groups um, can fully influence the process and not just participate um, and also um, our colleague from uh, from Myanmar uh, no noted that uh, community associations can be really strong um, multipliers in communicating adaptation priorities upward toward the national level and towards national processes uh, so I'll leave it there, but thanks so much uh, for, for the invitation to, to speak. Great, thanks, Christian. Yeah, some lots of really good points in there. Thank you. Um, so we'll move to the um, we'll move to the fourth theme, and then we'll be coming back again to hear a little bit more about the first two themes. So Jesse, um, you're welcome to tell us more um, about what came out from your discussion. Great, thanks Fiona. Well, actually I was facilitator come note taker. So we've delegated to Jess, who will do uh, our presentation here and our feedback to the group. Okay. Jess, over to Hi. you. Welcome, Jess. That's me. Similar names, so that's okay. Um, our group um, talked about creative effective linkages from local um, to national level. Um, really looking at, um, I guess, the challenge around the limited capacity of some national governments, particularly at local level, to be the link between communities and national level. Um, and in particular, and I really like this, this was our framing from Jesse about how we can empower communities to play and, and some national um, governments and, and others to um, play this role between levels, moving the needs and priorities upwards and the resources and capacities downwards. So we talked about that in our little group um, about some of the issues and challenges um, and really, um, and then also some of the solutions. So. Um, I guess the issues and challenges that we talked about largely related to information sharing between the different levels, between sort of community, um, sub-national, provincial governments and national, um, that sometimes the information that's shared is at different, um, I guess, uh, scales and different types of information that is or isn't shared. There can sometimes be institutional uh, barriers and politics as well. So depending on different levels of, say, government, sometimes the issues aren't fed up because there may be um, ideological and political differences. And obviously that depends on the context in which um, people are working. But then we talked about what some of the ways around these challenges are for feeding those um, community voices up the chain. And um, I guess we talked about a few different things, um, including that we need to um, build a level of trust and buy-in um, at all levels. Um, Welcome back everybody um, from, the, from the group work. And we will jump straight into sharing back the key points. If I can just ask that the reporters of the groups make sure you are uh, capturing everything, have captured everything in the Google Doc. Um, but I'll start um, to invite group one, Angie's group, um, if you could share in, in just one minute um, the highlights of what came out from the discussion in group one. Um, and if the reporters, if you could try to capture what your presenter says in the Google Doc, that will also be very helpful for the next step. Uh, so Angie, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about how to ensure that planning and policy making is responsive to gender and diversity. And I think two big things came out. One is the need to create platforms that link grassroots organizations together so that they can define collective priorities that can then be communicated by spokespeople for those collectives um, in government spaces um, through advocacy processes and through formal planning and participatory planning processes. And then the other big piece is that 
the governments who are guiding these processes, coordinating these processes, whether they're at subnational level or national level, need to create mechanisms and create negotiation spaces where these collectives of grassroots actors can um, bring their priorities forward. And we had some interesting examples from Bangladesh, from Niger, um, where, where this is happening. Um, I think there's an ongoing challenge in getting from the local level to the national level, but there's some interesting work being done that we can learn from. And I will leave it there. Great, thank you very much, Angie. Nice and um, concise, thank you. Um, Obed, let's move to your group. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fiona. In our group, uh, we were discussing on how communities and local participatory processes can better inform and influence subnational adaptation uh, policy and planning. And one of the main issues was to how to ensure this is effectively done by ensuring that communities uh, adequately feed into the subnational adaptation planning and uh, policy processes in an effective manner. And uh, a number of issues came up, uh, but one of the main issues that came up is uh, the issue of uh, capacity to, to engage. Uh, we find that, uh, for instance, in uh, an, an example from Kenya, where uh, the, there are structures that in, uh, involve communities uh, to participate in, in defining various pri uh, priorities in terms of adaptation needs at the subnational level, but they do not have the re relevant capacity even on, on what climate change is or what they need to uh, uh, feed into uh, these policy processes. So adequate uh, capacity uh, uh, to empower these communities is very, very necessary. And another uh, action was ensure that these consultations and, and, and community participation processes are done at the community level where the, the, those who are actually vulnerable uh, exist. Because one of the challenges that came up was that some of these consultations are done at the, at the, at, at the urban level where uh, the communities and those who actually need to engage are not able to reach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Obed. Um, I'd like to ask, um, I should have asked earlier, if everyone can listen up carefully to the points that are raised. Um, and if the point you wanted to share has already been said, pick a different point. Um, so let me ask now Christian if you'd like to share in just one minute some top priorities highlights from the discussion. Welcome Christian. Thanks Fiona. Um, we were talking about how communities and local participatory processes can better inform and influence national adaptation planning and um, we had a, an excellent discussion um, talking about the challenge of balancing strong participatory processes with uh, with deadlines and urgency to to kind of move these processes forward often coming from national and international processes so that uh, just very briefly the group um, um, kind of had a, a great discussion and there was a strong feeling that deadlines should be uh, set by countries themselves uh, rather than externally imposed as part of a broader shift um, to move from the agenda setting being in the, in the global north uh, to the global south and uh, there was also um, a point raised to overcome challenges in participation and to move from participation to influence there needs to be a strong awareness raising uh, so that the the vulnerable communities and uh, um, representatives from vulnerable groups um, can fully influence the process and not just participate um, and also um, our colleague from uh, from Myanmar uh, no noted that uh, community associations can be really strong um, multipliers in communicating adaptation priorities upward toward the national level and towards national processes uh, so I'll leave it there, but thanks so much uh, for, for the invitation to, to speak. Great, thanks Christian. Yeah, some, lots of really good points in there. Thank you. Um, so we'll move, to the, um, we'll move to the fourth theme and then we'll be coming back again to hear a little bit more about the first two themes. So Jesse, um, you're welcome to tell us more um, about what came out from your discussion. Great, thanks Fiona. Well, actually, I was facilitator come note taker. So we've delegated to Jess, who will do uh, our presentation here and our feedback to the group. Jess, okay, over to great. you. 
Welcome, Jess. That's me. Similar names, so that's okay. Um, our group um, talked about creative effective linkages from local um, to national level, um, really looking at, um, I guess, the challenge around the limited capacity of some national governments, particularly at local level, to be the link between communities and national level. Um, and in particular, and I really like this, this was our framing from Jesse about how we can empower communities to play and, and some national um, governments and, and others to um, play this role between levels, moving the needs and priorities upwards and the resources and capacities downwards. So we talked about that in our little group um, about some of the issues and challenges um, and really, um, and then also some of the solutions. So um, I guess the issues and challenges that we talked about largely related to information sharing between the different levels, between sort of community, um, sub-national, provincial governments and national, um, that sometimes the information that's shared is a different, um, I guess, uh, scales and different types of information that is or isn't shared. There can sometimes be institutional uh, barriers and politics as well. So depending on different levels of, say, government, sometimes the, the issues aren't fed up because there may be um, ideological and political differences. And obviously that depends on the context in which um, people are working. But then we talked about what some of the ways around these challenges are for feeding those um, community voices up the chain. And um, I guess we talked about a few different things, um, including that we need to um, build a level of trust and buy-in um, at all levels. Um, we need to build on existing initiatives and existing networks um, and where possible starting simple. So really um, making sure that um, the different levels engage, draw the voices in, um, and use the different formal inf and informal networks to make sure that they're feeding into the different levels. So um, I guess we talked a little bit about barriers, a little bit about the, the way the enablers and the things that um, can happen to help um, with that information um, flow. Um, but the other, the other topics that other speakers have spoken have already raised the need for, you know, that diversive and inclusive engagement to make sure all of those voices are heard. Um, so they're probably the key, the key things from our group. Hopefully I've represented it okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Um, interesting in many ways that all the groups so far, I think, ended up talking about the all the different levels and linkages. Um, and then you've given a very interesting framing, um, which could be useful for all of us. Um, moving, uh, coming round again to the, the gender theme. Um, Julius, do you have um, ideas and thoughts that came up that we haven't heard already from the other the other groups? And please take a minute to share. Thank you, Thank you Fiona. I think we were also addressing the same question uh, from uh, similar to Group One, and then I think uh, they have shared most of the points. What I can only add here is. The point on um, uh, improving access to productive resources uh, to the women uh, and and other vulnerable groups. For example, we had to take a lot of a lot of time discussing what could what what are some of the barriers that um, uh, for for example uh, that are making it po not possible for women to be represented for women to actually have their voices read, also not to actually progress in terms of. Uh, ensuring that they are adapting. So that's one of the points, but we also, um, uh, also uh, talked about the issue to do with improving laws and policies uh, to support women, women representation in different countries. So even though we can set up, uh, let's say, frame, um, frameworks and um, networks or platforms, but they will still need to have deliberate efforts where women can also be, you know, uh, by law or required by law that they, they need to be represented in different uh, uh, setups, even at a community level, the setups that are being made at community level, they need to be representative and there has to be a number where women should be actually uh, assisted. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Julius. Interesting, interesting. Um, so the final group to share, um, thanks for your patience, Chris, uh, Chris's group, um, again, around the sub-national level integration into subnational planning. Uh, Chris, uh, over to you. Or your representative. Hello. Okay. Uh, I think. Yes. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being repetitive. Uh, we share the same question now. Obed. Ob 
Chris, we're struggling to hear you a little bit. Um, would you allow Lalmani to chip in? Lalmani, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, okay, uh, I would, you know, I would uh, like to go uh, to the point uh, to share our uh, uh, discussions uh, to, uh, and in summarize some. We have very uh, diverse type of discussion uh, from different uh, players. So uh, 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 our, uh, from our discussion, we summarize the major challenges are the capacity of the community people uh, and their access to policy process. And the last one is the intention of the policy maker uh, to uh, not to include the or not to uh, respect and address the community people and the improvement uh, proposed in our uh, groups are uh, firstly we should uh, capacitate the people so that uh, so that uh, they may make able to uh, raise their voice and to uh, be uh, confident and second one is to develop the skill on the adaptation and governance process so the, so they can uh, develop and their own uh, adaptation uh, plan and adaptation activities and run the uh, run in their own uh, place and one reason so they can uh, sustain the adaptation process without the external support and they can be independent and they can be more innovative yeah, these are the points thank you thank you fiona uh, great, great. Thanks, Armani. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks, everybody, for your active participation in the group work. We have a very rich Google Doc full of all sorts of information. We've heard some key points. I realize our time is up, but we have a very exciting thing still to do. Um, and our rapporteurs and Angie have been busy while everyone's been talking, looking through the Google Doc, listening to your points and coming up with um, a list of um, up to 10 critical points that we really need to think about um, in order to improve um, grassroots voices, local voices, participatory processes, um, actually influencing um, adaptation planning and decision making. And so Michael is busy translating our 10 points that we have all come up with in through the through the initial um, sharing from the speakers and what you've discussed in the groups and what you've shared back from the group. So we've really got a, a co-created list of 10, 10 key points. Um, and what we're going to do now is that Michael will launch them as a poll where you'll have the opportunity to decide out of these 10 points, which do you think are really, really the most important to uh, changes and messages that we should take away from here and work on and make happen as intermediaries, which we very much are in terms of the role that we play. And we have many roles as intermediaries. Um, and so which of these 10 points, they're actually nine, no, they are 10. If you scroll down, you'll find the 10. Um, so please go ahead and select your two most important changes. Fiona? Uh, that document actually doesn't allow multi-selection, so it only gives you one choice. Okay, then you take one. Then it's single choice. There you go. So pick your top, top, top one. <laughs> and. Uh, when we are all done, we'll be able to see how we, um, as a group here um, of almost 30 people, um, what we would say to others that we need to do first. And while, while you're completing this, just to say that if you look in the marketplace area of the, um, I think it's the marketplace area, um, you'll find something around principles for locally led um, action in adaptation processes. And this is something that IIED and the Global Commission for Adaptation and others are, are working on developing a collective set of principles for, um, for 
for locally led action to be really effective and to, to for us to actually make that happen so what we'll do is we will actually be able to share um, these messages will will boost them up a bit so they're more understandable from these three words but we will share with them this outcome from the session so that they can see what we came up with as the top priority um, I think there's just a few people left so the last couple you could you could do your voting if you are there otherwise we could end the poll here and then michael if you could end the poll and share the result um and we're going to take a screenshot of this so thank you very much michael and interesting that finally collective grassroots platforms came out um, on top um so we are seeing that it's more important to um, empower and build agency and adaptive capacity, organizational capacity at the grassroots so that they can bring their voice. And that maybe is more important even than our engagement directly with the, the planners themselves in terms of the um, engaging subnational government. And legal frameworks didn't get a look in, maybe because they were number 10. Um, but interesting that um we're much more around um enhancing the engagement capacity and getting that stakeholder engagement and the negotiation spaces together with a really big push on collective grassroots platform thank you so much to everybody and again if you have time please don't go away because we would really like our host obed who hasn't had much to tell us so far um, to give us some final words and um, sum up um, what's come out from the session and where we might go from here and what Southern Voices might do with this from here. Um, and so uh, we'd like to hear from Obed and then we'll also give Angie um, the very last word. So Obed, over to you. Um, and thank you everybody for your participation today. Thank you so much, Fiona. I, I will not want to take much of your time because we are already way past time. Just want to uh, uh, reiterate that it's, also, it's interesting to see that uh, collective, uh, establishing collective gra uh, grassroots platform is actually one of the main uh, points that is coming out from, from this uh, discussion, uh, of course, among others, and, and, and it resonates with the main objective of uh, this session, which uh, of course ensures that uh, uh, discusses about how realities of communities and local participatory processes can inform local and subnational and national adaptation policy and planning processes. So um, this, these points uh, are very, very important, even in our advocacy work, as we, we keep on uh, influencing both local, nationals, and, and, and even uh, global policy processes. And um, as, as, as uh, Angie put it earlier on, uh, uh, some of these messages and, and what we are discussing today, especially in terms of uh, ensuring that adaptation planning pro policy processes um, correspond uh, to, to the requirements of, 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 of adaptation planning, uh, issues of gender responsiveness, uh, participatory uh, and, 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 and transparency, uh, ensuring that vulnerable groups, those who are actually vulnerable, take part uh, in, 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 uh, in, in policy planning and, uh, and, and uh, processes. And, and as CARE, uh, we uh, have working together with Southern Voices uh, uh, on adaptation, which is a, a coalition of Southern CSOs in the Global South that are engaged in uh, promoting and, and, and advocating for uh, policies that uh, ensure that communities that are affected by climate change participate in defining adaptation planning options and priorities. We will uh, continue, uh, we'll take these messages forward in, even in our advocacy work and uh, ensure that of course, that this uh, work is very, very crucial, ensuring that these policies consider the views of and, and, and in response to the needs of the most vulnerable people. So um, moving forward, uh, 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 these messages will continue with the with the dialogue and, and also talking about having conversation about the messages that have come out from this session. 
and, and of course, not only at the sub-national level, but of course, even at the national level, we've talked about the national adaptation planning processes, the NAPs that are, are currently ongoing. We have the NDCs uh, that are currently being revised, and some of these messages are very, very important in informing these processes at the national level. And at the uh, national level, also glo global level, uh, we have, of course, uh, the UNFCCC uh, engagements, uh, especially on the, on the NAPS and, and, and adaptation. And I'm happy to announce that uh, Southern Voices uh, and, and NAP Global Network as part of the technical working group on NAPS and, and will ensure that, of course, these messages uh, reach uh, this conversation that we're having at, at that level. And last but not least, as Fiona mentioned, uh, these messages uh, will be, contribute towards building up and, and supporting the momentum already created on locally led action, even as we look forward to the Climate Adaptation Summit uh, next year. So uh, without wasting time, I want to really thank you so much for your participation and, uh, and look forward to more conversations even uh, on, uh, on the WOVA platform beyond uh, this session. Thank you so much. Great, thanks Obed, thank you. Um, Angie, how do you, uh, what, do you, what would you like to tell us from the perspective of the NAP Global Network? Thanks. I'll try to be really brief. Um, I think that, you know, this idea of these collective platforms is essential, but my takeaway is also that we need to work with governments to ensure that they're creating these spaces for sustained stakeholder engagement so that as these platforms are becoming stronger and and more organized they have a point of contact where they can bring their priorities forward to inform these government um, planning processes at the different levels and i think one other thing that hasn't been a strong focus of the of the conversation but it was something that jessica said that i think is is really important to keep in mind in the current context where most of our work and engagement is happening virtually is that this creates opportunities we can bring more people in and that's very exciting but we also need to consider who is being left out of virtual engagement processes due to technology and connectivity issues and be sure that we're being mindful of that as, as we move forward in this strange new environment that we're working in. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone for active participation. It was, it was very interesting and, and I'm left with a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Angie. Um, and again, thank you to everybody for a, a really rich session. Um, I can see one point here, it would be great if the key messages drawn out from the sessions were shared with the participants. I've shared the Google Doc link, so please, you know, you can find our raw, our raw material there. Um, hopefully the key messages that we draw out from this session, we will be sharing it to the CBA 14 organizers, and therefore it will become available once the, the CBA conference sort of outcomes are, are available, and I'm sure that will also be on the, the Hoover app. So um, have a, you know, keep your eyes out for, for this session and the messages. But I just really like to say uh, um, thank you so much for you know, being part of what I could call a co-creation process um, that we actually, you know, started from a real diverse group of people and topics and themes and experiences, and we've landed on a set of prioritized key messages that, that we can take forward that are actually developed collectively. Um, and I think some really important points came out that Obed and Angie have also highlighted. Um, so thanks again to everybody. Thanks so much to Obed and Angie for making the session happen. Um, and thanks to the facilitators and rapporteurs and our Black people helping out on the um, on, on the Zoom side, um, and see you again in the next session or in the closing. Um, there's also just to say, Daniel started a chat in the community board. There's a chat about integrating um, local voices in adaptation planning, more or less the same as this session. So if you feel you have more to say, or you want to stress some of the points, or say something about what came out from this session then you could use that community board and that particular topic um, to continue the conversation. Um, otherwise, thanks so much and we'll end here.